I'm there. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I'm sorry. Bye. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hey, sorry about that. I, I'm at home tonight and I had trouble with my internet. So okay. no problem. Can you make me co host? Yes, I will. I, I just want to get everybody in first. So one second. All right. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Happy Veterans Day. Hello, Joe. Happy Veterans Day. Hi. Do we have um, audio? Uh, I have audio. I can hear. Can't hear Robin. Robin, you're muted. Um, Penny, we can hear you. Okay. That was my problem on my end. Okay. Hooray. Looks How about like now? Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Looks like you made me host now. Um, I made you co-host. Okay, good. I think you can do it all the same things. Great. Very yeah. good. Um, let me I also sure. made um, a penny co-host in case something goes wrong with your computer. That is always good to have backup. Okay. okay. All right. Thank Bye. you, Becky. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody, and happy Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day to everyone. Happy Veterans Day to our Associate Commissioner veteran in the crowd. Thanks, Don. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Um, we, uh, we've got a busy schedule now, um, now that we're starting 10 minutes late. Um, so we're convening. One thing um, we need to uh, deal with is minutes for tonight. I can take minutes if people would like or if somebody else wants to volunteer. Um, I'm happy to have somebody else do it. I will say uh, it's very challenging to chair the meeting and take notes if someone is willing to step in and do that. Well, I'm gonna do it from the recording, so I'm not gonna do it while I'm sharing. <laughs> but um, if somebody wants to take minutes, any volunteers, we gotta move along so we- I can give it a try. You wanna do it, Mary? Okay, thank I'll, you. I'll try. Okay. Um, okay, so we're calling the meeting for 710. Um, the first thing on our agenda, um, we're going to take things a little out of order tonight because we have a visitor is to meet with a representative from the Kestrel Land Trust to talk about the property on Pelham Hill Road that's up for sale. It's 34 acres, I believe, um, that Kestrel has been looking at. And Bridget likely is here tonight to talk with us about it. I sent everybody a site map and Jeff is here as well. Um, some of us did a site visit with Jeff last weekend. I was there and Beth was there. And I'm um, trying to think, um, Alan Hansen from the CPA committee was there and, um, and Kristen DeBoer from Kestrel Fund was there. Um, and um, the short version of the conversation is that there may be some funds available through Kestrel to facilitate purchasing this land. And, and I'm going to let Bridget maybe introduce us and tell us where you're at with the thinking. Can I, um, can I put the map up on um, screen share perhaps to? Yeah, feel free to do that. And I can kind of narrate what everyone's looking at. OK. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Bridget Likely. I'm a conservation manager at Castro Land Trust. Um, and I know that. Jeff Lacey spoke to you all about this project at your last meeting. And then as Miriam just said, you um, had a site visit on Saturday. Um, and so again, as Miriam said, this is 34 acres of land that's for sale currently um, for $275,000 is what they're currently asking. And so, um, you know, after the site visit and reviewing um, kind of, you know, how this fits into Keschel's interests and focus area, um, I think Kestrel is very willing to step up and take a, a leadership role in this project and contribute some funds to the acquisition. Um, so the funding that we have in place is from um, a grant program called Forest Legacy, and that's a federal grant program administered by the Forest Service. 
Um, and we already received this funding for another project in Belchertown and have some leftover funding that we can um, switch to this project because it's in the same focus area, the West Bobbin Woodlands. Um, and so what this federal grant program is willing to do is uh, contribute up to 75% of the acquisition and the purchase price. So that's about you know $200,000 or so um, could come from this uh, grant funding that we have. So that's really what Kestrel will be willing to put up in terms of funding. And then we need at least a 25% match um, from another entity, either uh, Shootsbury, whether that's CPA, um, it also could come from the town of Amherst because, you know, it is headwaters of the Amethyst Brook and it is surface water supply for town of Amherst drinking water. Um, and so we are exploring the possibility of the water department from the town of Amherst putting up some funding or whether it could be CPA funds from the town of Amherst. So those are all possibilities, um, but that's really what Cashel can do in terms of our funding. You want to give um, the commission a little bit of an overview of why this particular property is of interest? Yeah, so like I said, it does host the headwaters of Amethyst Brook, and so it's really at the start of the watershed for the town of Amherst. Um, and so we see it as a big um, focus area in terms of drinking water protection and as well as forest protection, which is why it would be eligible for this forest legacy fund. So this grant program is meant to um, help protect privately owned forest um, to support things like, you know, the continuation of forest management for drinking water protection, for recreation, et cetera. Um, and so that kind of all fits into Kestrel and this grant program's interests and um, intents. Uh, also, you know, as you can see from this map, kind of is a really great piece of land protection connection. It connects and abuts um, a CR we already have on Jeff Lacey's property. Um, and connects directly to other town of Amherst water supply land. And so it's just really adding to this great protection area that we have in place already. And that's linking up with the Coven Reservoir itself. Um, in terms of ecological value, it has very high ecological integrity. Um, we see it as, you know, continuation of a wildlife corridor. There's, there's lots of check marks that this uh, uh, piece of land hits. So we're very interested in, in helping secure this land for conservation. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions at this point? I guess I would just ask, I assume there isn't um, any because you didn't mention it, but are there any rare species habitat um, factors involved here? I don't believe it falls under Biomap 2. I would need to go back and double check. Okay. I have a question for Bridget. This is Penny Jakes, um, a long-term conservation commission member now filling in as interim um, clerk for the commission until they find um, a permanent staff person. Um, so the town has the possibility of some money to contribute to this, mm -hmm. but it isn't in hand at this moment. Um, we can apply for CPA funds but that wouldn't become available to us until next July after our, or yeah, I guess it would be July after town meeting. The Conservation Commission has enough money to cover this, but it's taken us 15 years to get to that amount and it would be hard to um, spend it all on this, I think, although um, it would be the commission's decision. And then there's always the possibility of writing up and remind me again what it's called. I think of it as a self-help grant. grant, a yeah, land yeah. grant. Is there yes. some way to sort of parlay front some money somehow with the promise of giving money back to Kestrel or, or is there some other mechanism that we might have available? Uh, yeah, there is possibility of Cashville fronting money um, with this forest legacy funding, a stipulation of it because um, it's already part of a grant we received. It does need, we would need to close on this piece of land by July, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the owner would like to close well before that. Yes. Um, so, you know, there's possibility of, of Kestrel or another entity, you know, fronting money to be reimbursed by the town. Right, um, and whether that's just very hammers. If the commission was supportive of this, perhaps the arrangement could be that 
the uh, the Conservation Commission's trust fund account for land purchase could be used with the hope that it would re be re partially. That would be um, sort of the backup if if uh, other things didn't fall into place. Okay, so you can do that with the self help with the land grant. Um, reimburse yourself for a purchase that's already been made. I don't know how that works, actually. Yeah, well, land, land grant is reimbursable. So you front the money and then the state okay. reimburses right. you. And, and our open space, my understanding is until you have um, a current open space plan in place, you can't apply for that pocket of money. And we should have a plan in place soon, but we don't have a plan in place today. Okay. Because the one we had is out of date, Penny? Mm -hmm. Right, it's a couple of years out of date. Okay, so just not enough. I'm working one. really hard to get get this done, but um, it, it's uh, it's a long process. I'm hoping. Yeah. So and you know the, next year, we were feeling a bit like the CPA route is uh, slower and and maybe um, you know less reliable, and that you know you never know what, what it'll pass town meeting, but. Um, but worth the effort. I mean, if we want to go forward, this certainly worth the effort of maybe um, applying and seeing what we can get. Scott, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to? Yeah, say I, I had a question for Bridget. So the sure. forest, forest Legacy Grant—that's a conservation easement, correct? Which? Yeah. So our ultimate vision would be that um, either you know. Shootsbury or the town of Amherst could hold the land in fee, so they would be the ones owning it, and then Cashel will be holding that easement, the conservation restriction. Do so. What are your thoughts on? Are there other private ownership outside of the town that that also could be a potential fee owner? Uh, is Kestrel a potential fee owner? You know, with the Forest Legacy protections in place because it, it seems as you said it would be great to see those conservation uh, provisions in place I'm wondering for the underlying fee ownership you know what um, what drives that towards the town of Shootsbury to be the, the fee owner and and it might be a better question for Miriam for you know for you or for others on the on the board do we have a a, a plan that you know directs us towards tracks with high wetland value. You know, I'm just kind of wondering where where does the town, you know, what what are do we have like some sort of strategic plan for where we want to be the underlying fee owners for properties like this that may already be protected through conservation easements through another party. Right. Well, let me ask a, a question, sort of related to that, um, and maybe mm -hmm. that Bridget can answer. Bridget, if Amherst were to hold the land in fee, um, would public access be assured for hiking and passive recreation? Yes, I believe um, passive recreation would be allowable um, to the town of Amherst. I don't believe they would have. Because one of the concerns that's been raised um, is that other properties owned by Amherst um, in the watershed has not been open for passive recreation. Um, and so there'd be a concern if Amherst were to hold it and uh, decide to put, you know, restrictions on people's access to the property. Okay. Um, you know, I, that was something we would need to confirm with the town of Amherst, um, and we're currently talking with them now. Um, but we would certainly take that in consideration. And then to go back um, to the previous question about, you know, the reason for the town even, you know, having an interest in holding the fee, I believe one of the stipulations of Forest Legacy is that um, a municipality or the state, they need to be the owners of the land. And I, I thought private landowners could be the underlying fee owners of, of Forest Legacy, but that's not correct. Yeah. My understanding is that it would need to be the town, but I can double check. Because uh, Coles has land in the Forest Legacy program and that's privately held. Yeah. I. I I do believe there are private ownership okay. for Forest Legacy. Not to say that the town 
you know, <laughs> that maybe this wouldn't be a good partnership. I'm just trying to understand, you know, what drives us, you know, towards mm -hmm. particular tracts of land, you know, that would be part of town ownership, um, but very, very supportive of the conservation easement restrictions for yeah. Port Legacy. Well, I will say from walking the property myself, and I guess, you know, what drives me is um, does the property have wetland values? Does the property have uh, potential for being an attractive and interesting place for passive recreation like hiking? And, um, you know, what does it do for forest co connectivity and conservation land connectivity overall? So, um, you know, to provide corridors of uh, contiguous forest. So this property kind of ticks off a bunch of those boxes. Um, it was a beautiful piece of property. It has beautiful wetlands. There's kind of streams going through it. There's an old remains of an old historic mill um, dam in on the property, which is pretty cool looking. We didn't know it was a dam until my husband looked, climbed on it or looked at it and said, oh yeah, it's a dam. Miriam, um, do you have that other map that I think I have that shows the wetlands? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I will look for it. Um, give me a second. Sure. Uh, this I, I, I have one that I can put up if. Yeah. Um, I was I just I... going to interject that um, as one of the people working on finishing up our open space plan, um, from the survey that went out to Shrewsbury residents back in the summer, the one thing that came out most strongly is Shrewsbury residents would like. Uh, uh, how do I say this? Places to hike where they feel confident they're not intruding on private property and, um, and it's accessible and there are trails that are marked. And so to me, uh, this could potentially check off all of those boxes. And so I would love to see it um, controlled by the Conservation Commission and uh, perhaps a plan developed between the Open Space Committee, the Recreation Committee, and the Conservation Committee to turn it into a great place for, for passive recreation. Um, so we're gonna need to move on in a minute. I'm gonna stop the screen share. Uh, because we have a public hearing, a public meeting scheduled for an RDA at 7.30. Um, if we wanted to apply for CPA funds for this, we would need to do that. We have to submit a letter of eligibility by December, December 1st or December 10th. It's, it's, it's early December. So we'd have to be working on it in the next month. I mean, I... I am interested in this and I certainly be happy to work with um, Kestrel to maybe pull together a CPA proposal. Okay, um, and Miriam, I'm happy to work on this too. I've submitted three okay. in the last Great. four years. So um, we're meeting, we're scheduled to- paperwork is very, it's only it's like- very limited, but it's yeah. very easy. Um, the, we are scheduled to meet as a commission on the second to talk about uh, notice of intent policies, but we could put this in there as well. And then perhaps come to an agreement um, and maybe there'll be some more clarity from Kestrel at that point. Would that be okay? People, yeah. could, could we Absolutely. plan perhaps maybe off, off, off this meeting, uh, Penny and Bridget and I could set up a, a meeting, an initial Zoom meeting where we could talk. Would that be okay? Great. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bridget, for coming. It's great um, to think about this and um, we'll talk more. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Okay, it is just about 727. Um, do we want to consider the minutes um, from last week before we start our public meeting for the RDA? Has everybody had a chance to look at them? This is yes. from October 28th. They looked okay to me. Looks fine to me too. Um, they looked fine. I made a couple edits um, for, on them that I gave to Beth. The only question I had was whether we had done a vote 
on the enforcement issue for um, 27 January Hills Road. And Beth didn't think we had made a vote that we just had sort of discussed it sort of in general principles and then we never voted on an action. Is that right? Is that what people remember? Anybody remember? That's <laughs> I remember that I was tasked with drafting something, which I did. I'm just not sure if we actually voted on a decision. Maybe we didn't vote. Okay, let's assume we didn't. So uh, somebody want to make a motion um, to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the, the minutes with the edits that Miriam uh, added. I'll second. I second. Oh, Robin seconds, okay, David. Aye. Uh, Defont, aye. Harrington. Aye. Vaughn. Aye. Is that it? Well, we got tonight, right? I miss anybody? <laughs> okay. All right. So, so pass. So, we should open the public meeting. It's seven twenty-nine. We might as well get started. Um, I don't think you can open it till seven thirty. I hate to be picky, right. but okay. got to play by the rules. Talking about minutes, um, I'm just noticing a couple of people here are not identified, and I'm wondering if they would be willing to identify themselves for the minutes. I see someone named Misha. I don't. Know if Misha would be willing to give us a name, last name, and somebody's email, Huit King. Yes, that's me. My name is Wim Levine. I oh. live at six three three Wendell Road. I am the property owner. That you're about to discuss the RDA for electrification. Okay. Okay, great. And. Um, and Misha chooses not to identify themselves. Okay. All right. Um, well, now it's 7.30. So let's open this meeting for, this is the RDA um, request for determination for um, National Grid to install utility poles for 585 Wendell Road. Um, and who's here to represent the project? It's Wim, Levine, and who else? Kate Wilkins, I see you, hi. Hi, yep, Kate Wilkins from Ty and Bond here for um, Massachusetts Electric Company. Okay, anybody else here as proponents, no? Okay, um, do you wanna take just a few minutes and sort of describe the, the, the uh, project? Sure. So the, the proposed project is a utility pole installation project. We're extending a distribution line down, um, down the roadway to uh, connect to uh, 585 Wendell Road. So right now there's a pole that ends at the road. There's a dirt road. We're extending it down to um, the property owner's house at 585. So we'll be replacing one existing pole that's right at the edge of where uh, the distribution line ends and installing seven new poles along the side of the roadway. Um, as part of the project, we're going to need to do some tree trimming and some tree removals. I believe um, Megan Wojtek was on site with a few folks from the commission and kind of went over the site and where tree removals would take place and um, kind of the overall pole locations as well. Um, um, are you doing, you're not doing the lines to the house, is that correct? Correct. That'll be part of the building permit? I believe yes, so, it, yeah. Yes, it's going to be underground. Oh, it's going to be underground. Okay. Um, well, I was on the site visit. I know Don was there. Mary was there. Um, Robin, were you there too? I was there. Yep. Okay. Um, and my understanding is this is considered to be an exempt activity under the Wetlands Protection Act, but um, you're here before us now because it's not technically exempt under our local wetlands bylaw. Um, so this is not, we're, we're applying a different standard here. It's slightly different language in the two statutes. Um, can I just make a point about that or a question yes, about ahead. that, Ms. Janice? Sure. Um, the exemption does not apply to new poles. And in the, the section that you cited also, the 1002 2B1, um, 
the minor activities. It's only if they are solely within the buffer zone and you're not, you're in the riverfront and very close to the stream. There's a so, riverfront area exemption as well. Okay, I'll look under that other section. But it says minor activities within the buffer zone and any outside area specified blah 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 are not subject to regulation provided that the works performed solely within the buffer zone. Okay, I'll check the riverfront one. Yep. I think it is also the same language in riverfront. Yeah, it's activities A through H or J, I can't remember offhand, um, that are also covered under riverfront. But if we're in BLSF, we get pushed out of that as well. So it's the riverfront. But, but you're riverfront. saying but you're saying, Janice, that yeah. it's not a minor activity because they're new poles as opposed to repair of poles. Yes, because that's the other part. It's just maintenance, repair, and something else of uh, poles. That's under the to be two, to be two, whatever. Um, activities conducted, maintain, repair, or replace, but not substantially change or enlarge an existing and lawfully located structure or facility. So you are adding seven new poles or six new poles, whichever it was. I'm just opening up my regulations because I can't set sure. them offhand. I know. Um, <laughs> I can't either. Sorry. I got it in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in that same section, mm -hmm. I can actually open it up. Okay. Again, I'm taking it from 1002. You're maybe looking at it at 1058. Jeez. I'm pulling it up. Um, so if you look at 1022 B activities within the buffer zone, yeah. and we look at letter K or no, J. Sorry. Installation repair of uh nope, wrong one. Where did it go? H. H, installation of directly embedded utility poles and associated anchors, push braces, or ground mat rods along existing paved or unpaved roadways and private roadways and their existing maintained shoulders or within existing railroad road right of ways, provided that all work is conducted within 10 feet of the roadway or driveway shoulder and is a minimum of 10 feet from the edge of bank or bordering vegetated wetland. Okay. So you say that you fit under that, then that you're at least 10 feet from yes. those other resource areas. So, so Kate, this is Don Walkluck. Uh, I'm an associate member. Hi. Uh, when we were on site, uh, the understanding was that there wasn't going to be any excavating done, that you'd be only augering in these poles. Um, however, you, uh, we did talk briefly about the likelihood that th this is a this stream is a kind of a flashy stream and has the potential to flood the embankment there, and you're planning on well you're not planning on it uh, whoever is planning on doing the work is anchoring these poles uh, along the stream bank, and um, I I just don't see I I've gone back to the site because I'm also the tree warden and was looking at the trees that were being removed. Um, I'm glad that you took that large DBH oak out of uh, the removal, by the way. Mm -hmm. That would have had to been posted. Um, it's large enough that it could be considered by some a tree that they want to keep. Anyway, uh, that embankment there is all flooded out, usually in springtime. And uh, anchors are not, there's no stipulation as to how these poles are being set and where they're being anchored at. And we, we looked at the site, we walked along the stream there, there's definitely overflow going on in those embankments there. So I'm just wondering if, if you're not excavating, how are you gonna stabilize these poles in this soft ground? Well, the, I, I mean, I don't know the engineering behind it, but when they install them on these areas, um, we are augering down about eight feet into the ground. 
um, and they'll install the pole. They backfill around it with suitable material, usual gravel or existing material that's there. Um, pack it down as much as they can to get their right compaction around the poles and then set the anchors as well. But if the anchors are set in ground that I consider unstable, the embankment of the stream, and that's a flood prone, prone area, um, are, we, are we creating a hazard? The engineers at National Grid have looked at this and kind of uh, evaluated where the anchors need to go and where they can go. It's, a, it's based on opinion more so than technical. Um, from what you're saying, I totally get where you're coming from. If it's an area that floods and there's a potential for erosion of the site or um, unsuitable material, they put the anchors down and they actually have to pull them um, until they get a certain uh, tension on them. So if, if it pulls out and they're not getting the correct tension in the ground, um, then they have to reevaluate and they might have to put it on a different anchor or a different pole um, or put the anchor in a different location. Okay, so my understanding was one of the poles, the pole I think we're talking about, Don, is was is kind of perched kind of above the flood zone somewhat. Um, so we wouldn't want to see it moved anywhere closer into where the bank right. over. I, I, that's what I was getting at is that you have a limited space there to work with. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if anybody's thinking about things like perhaps push braces rather than stabilization cables. I, I don't, you know, I don't see that kind of um, forward thinking going on here. I, what I'm hearing is a lot of sort of uh, boilerplate. We're going to put the poles in and cut these trees down and everything's going to be fine. And I, that's not what I'm seeing on site. Hmm. I'm sorry that I can't really talk to the, the engineering side of it. We kind of get pulled in to present the plan as uh, as designed. We throw in the environmental concerns and constraints, but uh, the design of a anchor versus a push brace is not necessarily something that we can change. We can suggest it if that's what the commission would like to do, um, but and have the engineer come back and provide more detail on why they're putting it where they're putting it. But um, I, okay. I personally can't do that. I, I just wanted to voice my concern about where you're anchoring these poles. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I haven't taken up enough time talking about it. I just, I, I was concerned with the trees being removed, but le less so if I thought that the poles were stable. Scott, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I, so I'm thinking about, you know, our responsibility here from the, the Conservation Commission really is in wetland protection. And so I would leave it to National Grid and their engineers to come up with the best ways to secure the poles to, to make sure that they are not gonna fall down in the future. But I don't have a concern about the imprint of the pole and the impact on the wetlands. I think, you know, they're alongside the road. Frankly, I think the road has more impact on the associated streams. and. The maintenance of the road, then the, the poles are going to have. So I don't have any concerns for this project. I'd move that we that we go forward for approving it. Well, can we just have can we hear from other commissioners before we have a motion to entertain Scott? Is that all right? Um, sure. Can we hear from other commissioners, Mary and Robin. Do you feel like you have enough information? Do you have any questions? Yeah, I mean, I think especially from the site visit. I mean, we did walk and look at them and. I think for the most part, I wasn't as concerned about the anchors. You know, I think I understand the concern, but I do think that if it's not going to anchor into the soil, then they're going to look for a different solution. Um, yeah, I would agree because I was on the site visit and um, I was pretty impressed with, you know, where they were putting them and, and what their plans were. All right. Um, do we feel? Does the commission feel like we have enough information to close the public meeting? Are there any more questions? Any more? Any, anything anyone from the public wants to say? I know there's a bunch of people here. I don't know if there's any other comments. I would. Uh, this is Wim Levine. I I just have a question um, as the 
as the consumer here, the guy who's footing the bill, um, this is an extremely expensive project. I received the proposal today or yesterday from National Grid. Um, and I don't mind sharing with you that it is $47,000 um, of work. Um, and so I assume the engineering based on that cost must be pretty complete. Um, <laughs> I wondered if I could ask the representative from Tigan Bond um, whether their work, because I've got a, even after you approve this, which I hope happens, um, I have to think about it based purely on cost. Um, and I wondered whether the report from Tigan Bond would suffice to satisfy the commission if we contemplated trenching rather than poles, or is that a completely different matter? I think it's a different matter because it's, um, it's more ground disturbance. I also think that might be, I don't know if the proposal said the poles versus trenching, but it was always my understanding that trenching from an existing, for that length is going to be more expensive. Oh, it would be. That's that's always been my impression from other projects, but I'm not 100% sure. So I just want to um, remind the commission that it's 744 and we have another public meeting scheduled for 745. We have a tight schedule. All right. Um, so I guess, are there, is there more comments or um, is there a motion to close the, the meeting? Do you, I just have a question. Make a motion are to you, close you, the meeting. I'm sorry, Janice, what did you wanna say? I was just wondering, are you gonna discuss uh, special conditions? Does that happen after you close the meeting or what? Um, usually we do that after. after okay. we, really the question is, do we have enough information to close the hearing? Um, yes. Okay, so Mary, are you making a motion to close the hearing? I'll make a motion to close the hearing. Okay. I'll second, second. that. Well, Scott seconds it. David? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Um, Harrington? Aye. And Khan? Aye. Okay. So we will deliberate about this later and work out if there's going to be conditions or not. Um, Given that it's an exempt activity um, through the uh, Wetlands Protection Act, I'm I'm not really sure that it makes sense to issue a negative number three with um, conditions. It may be just be a negative determination with no conditions. It's kind of whatever the commission feels appropriate. Sometimes I guess it's helpful to use the state forms and process if you don't have- yeah, and We don't have a, a, right. a, a DOA form, so we would use the state forms. Um, we just reference that we're applying this, the, the uh, local bylaw for this. Okay, so it's 746 and I, I wanna kind of keep the ball moving. So we need to move on to our next RDA. And thank you, um, Kate, for your time with us and Wim. So and will, we, today, will we know if it's going to be Yes. Approved or not, or we would we would email you tomorrow, I think. So okay, because I you, or you can stay to the end of the meeting. Or you can stay to the end of the okay. meeting. Okay. <laughs> All right. So oh, that's good to know. We would definitely let you know tomorrow. Okay. I just okay. want to make sure I, I'm mostly just concerned of some reason there's a positive determination issue. Yeah. Is okay. All right, let's open. It's the 747, and we're gonna open the public meeting for a request for determination for 24 Lake Drive, Whitney. Um, this is a driveway paving project. And um, if you guys would like, I will see if I can pull up this site plan. I think I can, I think I have it open. Let me find it. I have a lot of site plans open right now. Uh, where'd it go? Things seem to disappear here. Give me one sec. Okay, here we go. Maybe it's just in the RDA. Let me see if I can scroll down. Okay, so is this, this is not, what am I looking at? Do you see it? 
Do you guys see it? <laughs> I'm not sure if I yes. see it. Okay. I see the, the yes. beginning, a portion of the first page. So. Yeah. Okay, let me try to find it because I can't find it in my <laughs> many open documents for facilitating a meeting. It's, um, here we go, Whitney. Got it, thank you. All right, okay, so let me see if I can pull up this. I think there's a site plan at the end of this that I can pull up hopefully. Yep. That's what we have for a site plan. Um, who is here to talk about the project? Uh, Kent Whitney. Hi, Ken. Hey. So I was at the site visit for this with Beth Wilson, I believe. Okay. Um, and my recollection from that was that this is a pretty flat open area. There was no significant sloping involved in this driveway project. And aside from the lake, um, no other wetlands in the near vicinity, except there's a a funny drain across the street. That's on the other side of the street, uh, on the other side of Lake Drive. The, it all slopes so the water goes down to that drain, but yeah. There's a funny culvert <laughs> that empties into the lake from stormwater from the road, just for the commission's knowledge um, that exists. <laughs> Not on my property. <laughs> Not on your property, nothing related to this, but maybe something for future pondering. So would you like to just tell us a little bit about what the project's gonna involve, Kent? Yeah, so we have an existing gravel driveway that's depicted there. Um, and uh, currently during the winter time, we can't, it's gravel, so we can't plow it and wet the snow blower, I can't get it off enough. So we have to end up, there's a parking area up on the top of our land away. Um, and so we end up having to park there and uh, walk down a slope to the house uh, in the winter time. And what we plan to do is just gravel that so we can, I can snow blow it better and that the sun can get at the blacktop a little bit and we can park right by the house. Um, cause we, we don't, we abandon it during the, the winter time just cause it gets, um, it, because I can't get it uh, clear enough. There's a, there's a little slope at the beginning and then if you go down to the bottom, it's flat. And in fact, it actually even goes up a little bit before it hits the lake. So there's no water that drains towards the lake. There's a, there's a little, if you're looking from Lake Drive to the left-hand side, there's a little swale down in my land that if there is water that drains off, it drains down to the left-hand side, but nothing drains towards the lake because it goes flat and then even up a little bit before the lake. Uh, and, uh, and the road as the water from the road itself, as Marion mentioned, it's the lake drive is sloped off to a culvert on the other side of the road so that the water doesn't come in that direction from the from the road. And Kent, are you, this is Penny Jakes, are you um, increasing the size of your drive and parking area at all or are you just paving an existing area? Just following the outline of the existing gravel. And will you be excavating the gravel to put the pavement down? The, I think he puts a, there may be areas of flattening out. He puts a layer of uh, additional gravel on top and then the hard top on, on top of that. Um, so there, there may be some uh, evening out of the surfaces. Thank you. Any other questions? I, this seemed very straightforward compared to some of the other um, right. projects. I agree. And my, I my agree. Only, Penny's, Penny again, my only comment is that um, it has nothing to do with this specific, uh, specific project, but just the trend to create more impervious services um, near the lake where there are already storm, storm water runoff problems and uh, just something to think about in the broader context. Yeah, it's a problem. In, in um, this, I mean, here it, it doesn't go in that, it, but it, I, I understand the broader context. Right, yeah. It, it's, not, it's not a criticism of your project. It's really just looking at the, yeah. uh, the bigger yeah. overall picture of more paving um, in the vicinity of the lake. Ken, are you um, going to be adding any kind of berm between 
the end of your driveway and the road? Um, I don't, I can make sure there isn't because I, my daughter also has a little car, so I can't make much of a burn, you know, I don't want to make a big burn there anyways, just because of her small That's car. been a concern we've had with other projects along even Lake Drive where people have burned their driveways. Um, and I think that we've talked as a commission that we really would like people not to be doing that because it really changes the flow patterns from stormwater on the, on the, um, on the road. Like I, the water's got to go somewhere. So the person who doesn't berm ends up, if everybody berms, then you've got a tunnel. So um, we really would prefer that not to happen. Yeah, I, I, I don't really want one there. And as, as you know, the water that slopes off on the other side anyway, so I don't, okay. It's not the per the, the berm would just uh, make it hard for smaller cars to get in and out. So okay, so it sounds like that you'd agree to that because we might put that in as a condition. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there's going to be some. I don't know what the uh, definition of a of a berm is. You know, I I mean, it it, it might be slightly higher than the existing road, or I, I just don't know how it ends up. Or do you might want it eventually, even with the existing road? I don't, I'm not we sure. Want, we would want it even because the idea is that it wouldn't change water flow patterns. Yeah. Um, if that's condition, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, any other questions or concerns that people have? No. no. Okay. All right, um, does somebody want to make a motion to um, close the hearing? The, me the public meeting, I mean? So I'll make a motion to close the public meeting. Okay, Miriam seconds. David? Second. Aye. Oh, Robin? Robin? Aye. Stefan? Aye. And Khan? Aye. Okay. All right. Um, we have 20 minutes. We're doing really well with our time. We have 20 minutes before our next public meeting. Do we want to discuss the, um, uh, you know, our findings for either of these two right now in this time that we've got? I think that would be good. My thought about um, the utility poll would be that we, would probably issue, I would recommend issuing a negative determination with no conditions. I would agree with that. I, I would just say, I don't, I would like to see that at least says that it, that it, that they adhere to no work uh, within 10 feet of bank or BVW just as a limit of work. Cause that's what's required in order to meet that exemption. Okay. All right, then that would be a negative determination number three. Are there any other conditions we want to consider? I mean, actually, a negative determination. I mean, we're going by the town bylaw. We're not even. Yeah, we're not but... really <laughs> re required to use that that format for um, WPA's program uh, form, but we will anyway. Um, so, Janice, can you repeat that one more time, just so we have it written down? No work within 10 feet of the bank or BVW. That's the language in the uh, exemption. Okay, thank you. It's Mike. okay for even if it's in riverfront, Janice? Yeah, apparently, you know, you can go under the riverfront, but it still requires that distance from the other, from the bank or, or BVW. Okay. And if they did have to go within 10 feet, then it would be a notice of intent? I, I don't know. It's under your own stuff. So, you know, it, it, if it's not actually in it, then I suppose you could still say it's buffer zone and they could still come back with a new request if there has to be a change in the But um, it wouldn't, if you're talking about the Wetlands Protection Act. If it their minor exemptions yeah. you're saying under the wpa the minor exemption wouldn't would fall apart if it's within 10 feet yes that's true right so you could be different for you but yeah okay they have to just submit another rda now under the wetlands protection act yeah yep because that but if it's um 
if it's not exempt, does that mean it has to be a, no a notice of intent? Not if it's in the buffer zone. Well, it's also riverfront, but it's along the roadside within the riverfront, right? So it's not likely to have an impact on the riverfront. Okay. So All right. Um, so, Janet, um, I will. You need to vote on that. You need to vote on that. So, um, but on um, yeah. But we really should have the language, and I'm, and I apologize. I was going to pull up a draft um, draft of the special conditions, and uh, all I got was the uh, the piece that we. So, how do we want to write I this? I think you're fine with this one condition, and um, we can just add it to the form. Right, it's short enough that you can just add it to the form. Yeah. Okay. And when right. you use that, when you use it for bylaw only, usually you write on the top of the page underneath where it says Wetlands Protection Act form or whatever, just add like shoot spray bylaw or something like that. Just so it's clear that that's what it's going under. Okay. Um, do people feel okay with voting on this without screen sharing the document so we can just put this together later or I can put this together later? I do. That okay? Yes. All right. So um, I'm going to make a mo Miriam is going to make a motion that we reach a determination of applicability under our local wetlands bylaw with a negative determination number three with conditions. The only condition being um, that the work has to be outside of the ten foot of um, BBW or bank. Do you have a second? Mary, I'll second. Okay. David? Aye. Stefan, aye. Harrington? Aye. Khan? Aye. And are you guys okay with us digitally signing for you? Yes. Yes. This is Mary. Okay. All right. Good. Wow, look at that. We got one done by so quickly um should we now for the second one um i feel like we probably are going to want more conditions and what i'm going to do right now is try to locate those draft conditions i don't know if you guys had an opportunity to look at what i sent i know i sent a bunch of things last minute but um we had had a conversation last week last time we met about wanting to have a template of standard conditions that we could draw on and then, you know, kind of fine tune, uh, you know, fine tune them compared uh, according to the particular project. So that's Mary, what I, Miriam, I haven't a had a chance to look at that, but yeah. is this different than the MACC list that has lots of special conditions for all circumstances? Um, it's based on that. What I did was I took out stuff that was clearly related to a notice of intent because I didn't think that would be relevant for RDAs. I figured, you know, most RDAs are, are simpler, but these are a lot more conditions than we typically use. But I, let me, um, I'm just trying to find the document. Give me one sec, because um, I did not keep it open. Okay, I'm gonna save, I'm gonna share this document right now, screen share it. I could stop whatever I was screen share, screen sharing something. Uh, short version. Okay, everybody see it? Ah. <laughs> now I do. Yeah. Let me try to get down to the back. So um, the format that I've seen used is that you have some brief findings, which we've done, um, but basically sort of saying what the resource area is and making a statement that you don't think there's going to be an impact with the conditions. Um, and is that, uh, just, we've never done that previously. Is that really necessary for an RDA or is that more um, appropriate for a notice of intent? Well, it's more appropriate for a notice of intent, but it seemed like it would just be a good practice um, to reference whatever, uh, 
plans or RDAs this was attached to. Um, but again, I, it's not um, it's not essential, I think. Um, the general conditions, what I've added in here, I think that are important are a condition that allows us to do uh, inspections, that gives us the authority to do follow-up inspections, um, and that make it clear that the applicants have to be in compliance with the Wetlands Protection Act, or else they could be, um, that they, they have that burden to remain um, responsible for the property, including any of their contractors. Um, and that, um, what else do I have in here? You know, that they have to comply with all statutes. Um, we can inspect um, that no work shall be undertaken until all administrative appeal periods have expired. So I think it's 10 days for an RDA for a determination of applicability. So it would be 10 days. Um, and then going down, um, if any change in the plan would alter um, an area subject to the Wetlands Protection Act or the town bylaw, they would have to come back to us. Um, uh, and again, the stockpiles of materials need to be um, tarped. Slurry pits have to have erosion controls. Those are pretty standard things that we've required for most of our things. Um, there's some stuff like, you know, you can't bury anything or, or discard anything in the wetlands. You can't dump any fuel or pollutants in any resource areas. I don't know if that's necessary or not. Do you guys have an opinion about that? Well, I mean, it's, I kind of like seeing it there, even though it's kind of a no brainer, but it's like somebody does it. It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's boilerplate. Um, and then moving down things, this is all more of the same dumpsters have to be outside of hundred feet of the resource areas. That's not possible in some sites, though. Well, I guess that would be something that we could tailor to a particular property or project. Um, uh, a trash dumpster is not as big of a concern as if it's just unconsolidated trash, I think, also. Um, and then pre-construction conditions, that we would have a pre-construction meeting to confirm erosion controls. I think we were talking about wanting to do that on a consistent basis, as well as having a follow-up visit at the end, something Mary had suggested at the last meeting, so I've added that. Um, so pre-construction condition would be the erosion controls are installed as depicted or discussed, um, no stumping, minimal tree removal, um, May, and this was when I added that erosion controls will be inspected and maintained as necessary to keep them functional. I think that's an important, um, mm -hmm. because we have seen situations where erosion controls just, you know, a project took so long that the erosion controls really decayed and weren't really needed refreshing. That's an important one. I'm glad you put that in. Mm -hmm. The other one I have is um, I thought might be a useful one is that there's an adequate stockpile of erosion control materials on site for any emergency contingency. So if there's a big storm and things get flooded, that there'd be materials available for quick repairs. You don't have a situation where somebody says, well, I couldn't get to Home Depot. Um, uh, no construction or ground disturbance when it's raining or expected to rain the same day. That's that we've had that for a, a number of different conditions. Um, and then reserves the right to impose additional conditions on portions of this project to mitigate any impacts from erosion. I'm not sure we really need that because we always have the right to do an enforcement order. Number eight, I think maybe we don't need that. So just to, to be clear, Miriam, are you suggesting doing this for all 
determinations of applicability or you're going to pick and choose depending on the project? Well, I think it's going to be individualized, but that there might be um, many of these would be general conditions that we would approve. You know, my, my immediate reaction is it makes what is often a very small project like paving a driveway um, seem um, intimidating. You know, just traditionally we've had just the, the conditions that really are relevant to the particular site. And I think what you've done to have all of these here sort of to pick and choose from is great, but um, I think your typical applicant who's doing a minor project is going to feel kind of overwhelmed by this level of information. Well, I guess my thought about it is that um, most of this is really for the applicant's education <laughs> so that they understand and aren't surprised or caught um, off guard later down the road if there's a problem and they didn't know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I agree but, with that because I think a lot of people we've talked to are, are like, well, I don't know, I didn't understand. I right. think this is just more to clarify up front so as people go through this they they understand or can ask questions about the details the, the other thing i had what i was going to say is that i think that we're doing we are approving a lot of projects through the rda process with conditions and some of them probably an argument can be made should have notices of intent but we have, have chosen to use the rda vehicle because it's more user friendly to the applicant, um, but I worry that you know, in doing that, we may be not creating enough of a vehicle to make it possible for enforcement if there needs to be enforcement um, by, by not being clear enough about what our expectations are. For example, like the issues about maintaining and repairing and inspecting your erosion controls rather than it's a one once and done kind of thing. I think that some of this could be uh, simplified. I, you know, I did this in a hurry today and I didn't go back through it and edit it for, you know, are there some redundancies here? And I think there probably are some, but um, anyway, let's just go through this quickly and then we can get on to discussion. So here was specifying where the erosion controls would be if that's clear. Um, erosion socks will not use hay. Um, description if there is a reference to where the erosion controls will go. And then basically at any time and after, during and after construction or until the site is stabilized, the commission may require the applicant to modify, augment or restore or maintain erosion controls. This may be, you know, this again is information. It's kind of implied that, you know, if we're gonna go and inspect things that we have the right to ask you to fix things but it's just making it transparent to the applicant. Um, and then the construction phase was shorter um, that whoever's doing the work, you know, notify us if there's a problem, um, inspect equipment. Again, maybe that's not necessary that equipment be inspected for leaks. I don't know. That's Maybe that's that's overkill. Um, you know, maintaining erosion controls until the one while the site is still unstabilized, and then a post-construction site visit. Um, then there's more of this stuff. Um, this is all construction, and then down here, um, maintaining erosion controls until it's stabilized, and then a range of post-construction site visits. I mean, we certainly could shorten a lot of these. I think that a lot of these are good and that it would be best to sort of pick and choose depending on the size of the project and all. I see what you, I agree that some of the projects that have gone through as requests um, really probably should have been notices like that um, 31 Lakeview. And so, you know, you look at this and you say, yeah, we should have had a lot of this in the determination to just clarify what was needed. Um, but on other very 
short term limited um, area projects probably you only know, need a couple things about you know access to the site I think is good and um, maintaining erosion control some of that sort of stuff. Okay, well, why don't we I would argue, this is Penny again I would argue that if you need this many conditions, the project probably should have been an NOI not an RDA. And certainly Mr. Salvatore's project, that is the case. Yeah. But then that's on us. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I think this is also spelling it out. It's good to us to remind us, should we be recommending something different too? Um, and some of this stuff is just information and not, you know, necessarily con conditions that everybody should be doing big project or not big project. So um, we've got just a couple of minutes before we need to go on to the next um, meeting. So I don't know if we, maybe we can resume this for um, the 24 Lake Drive after the next meeting and we'll, we can iron it out for the two RDAs that we have before us. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes. Yes. Okay. And maybe we can we can reduce this. Um, you know, I think what might be helpful going forward is to get some commissioners to take turns drafting the orders of condition. Um, if you know if they look at a project and can use this as a template and come up with a proposed um, list of conditions, if we arrived at a negative number three. Um, so that when we come in, they're already, it's already prepared and then we can, we can add or remove things, but to have the template kind of already tailored might be helpful if people want to work on doing that. Um, okay, so we are now at 815 and we need to open the public meeting for 105 um, West Pelham Road. Could, you, could I just ask one question before I leave? Um, yes, will I get an uh, email tomorrow or some uh, notification uh, as far as the project? Yes. Okay, that's, <laughs> thank you. Uh, hello, excuse me, may I make a comment? I'm just, um, I'm, my name's Anna Mancibo and I live at 26 Lake Drive. I would ask Miriam that if there is a site visit where anyone will be going on the property, that the owners are notified. Uh, we have a liability uh, if anyone gets hurt and I do not want that to happen. So this is more to protect you, but if there is gonna be a site visit about any of the conditions, I would ask that the owners are notified in advance. Could you I, just give me your name again for the minutes? Anna. Mancibo. Thank you. Yes, I, I imagine you're referring to um, when we were on your property. Yes. Doing the site visit for 24. Yes. And yes. we were there right on the property, on the edge of the property um, and observed the problems with the um, erosion controls. We did walk on your property. Yes. Uh, my my uh, relative was there. So yeah. I would just, if that could be a, a, a responsibility of the uh, team, I would really appreciate that. We have liability insurance and builder's risk, and I need to make sure that I'm I'm following the policy. Yeah, I don't know um, how that works, whether the Conservation Commission has the right to do unannounced site no, visits. No, they no. do not. You do not. You always oh. have to have you always have to have permission from the property owner. It's a private property, yes. For That's all not... properties, the commission needs permission from the owner. Okay. That's great to hear. Well, we apologize for um, for that. Um, and we're glad that you were able to repair the erosion controls so quickly. Yes, that absolutely. Was... Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so it is now 817 um, and we have the RDA for 105 West Pelham Road and 
who's here? Well, I see Willa Jarnagan is here. And is any, do you have anybody else with you, Willa? Uh, just me. Okay. So um, this was the property where we did two site visits. Um, and I was not at the second site visit. Um, who was there? I know Beth was there and Don. I was there. there. Who else was there? I was at the second one, but not the first. Okay. And uh, Mary, were you there or Scott? Uh, no. Okay. So um, I had a brief conversation with Beth um, and it sounded like um, perhaps there were some resources that were found. I mean, do you wanna summarize what the results of the site visit were? Somebody wanna do that? Don, do you want to? I mean, Abby, I can describe what I saw. Um, we saw that at the bottom of the driveway, it's been receiving water. It's a very steep driveway. Uh, the water uh, sort of runs off the end and there was uh, numerous uh, wetland indicator plants there. Jewel weed was uh, pretty predominant in the area. Um, the plan describes a a channel or a uh, culvert uh, or a dry well, we're not sure which, at the end of the driveway, that would be a sort of a catchment basin. Um, that needs to be elaborated on a little bit more. Um, uh, the, the plan that we were given um, when we were on site there uh, indicated that uh, it wasn't really finalized yet that they weren't sure what they were gonna do with the water at the end of the driveway. Um, uh, it, it certainly is an area that has wetland characteristics. It could become more so. And actually, you know, the, the driveway itself is gonna, yeah, there we go. So at, at the bottom right hand, you see where the water is coming off the driveway. Hold on one second, because I, I shared it, but I can't see it. Oh, here it is. Okay, now I found it. <laughs> okay. So I, I don't know if there's some planting that they could put in there, if there's some way they could uh, uh, use put a filter strip of gravel or riprap at the end of that driveway, but that sort of has to be finalized um, in some way uh, on this plan. One of the questions I had looking at the site plan is it looks like the water, um, and I think that north is uh, to the left, that the road runs right. north south. Um, so we're talking, if I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, I'm talking about the north side of the driveway. Um, it looks like the water is gonna be directed uh, down the hill and to the south side of the house. And I wondered why not create some sort of a detention basin or rain garden, maybe even better yet, in this little area um, around the turnaround, um, maybe just um, west of the turnaround, I guess. Or north of the east of the turnaround. Um, Willa, do you want to do you want to comment on that? Um, I just uh, wanted to say that we uh, we don't actually get that much rain coming down the driveway. It's only during very torrential rainstorms. Um, it it tends to just come down the driveway and sort of slant off toward the um, I guess the south. And um, so we're going to have a uh, riprap at the end um, and, and hay possibly. Um, so um, I just wanted to add that comment. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the concern was that, you know, the wetland area that, we're, that we've identified is over to the south of your house and a little forward of your house, a little in front of your house, and that all of this runoff from the driveway, from the road, will just kind of get 
going in this one direction, why not move some of this water over to the other side of the driveway and, um, you know, kind of slow the water by, by having it go into a detention basin up higher. It just seems like that would be, it would uh, limit how much water gets down to your, draw, your house and also to the wetland. What do other people think? Um, you guys following what I'm saying? It's hard. I keep, I'd like to point to things, but you can't see my pointer, right? Right. What if I I'm just trying to yeah, remember? We can, we can I can see, see the pointer. See pointer. What? We can see your pointer. We can see the pointer. Oh, you, you could. But, some, lost, but I lost your. I stopped sharing. So this is the area where I was yeah. thinking about a stormwater feature, like a. Mm -hmm. a I mean, maybe a dry detention basin, but maybe even better yet, a rain garden. I mean, which is um, planted with plants. Um, and it's not an additional cost, really. I mean, it, it, it's sort of an afterthought. It's a way of uh, slowing down the runoff off the driveway or, you know, when they're building the driveway, they're gonna have the option to tilt the water to the left or tilt the water to the right. And the way it stands now, the design just sort of all dumps the water to the bottom right. Yeah, that just doesn't make sense to me. It just seems like the water should get distributed more. Right. Um, May I add a comment? Yeah, Will, go ahead. Um, so our house, in the bottom of the drawing, you see where the steps are. So our house is there. Um, so if we were to divert water in the other direction, it, we're a little concerned that it would just come toward our house. Um, well, no, if you had a basin, a detention basin here, um, or, or like a rain garden, it would be, there would be, it wouldn't go ideally beyond, if, if the water is flooding that much, it's going to go toward your house, whether, whatever you do. Um, but the idea is to take some of the water away so it doesn't get this far down on the driveway. So it means kind of sloping. I'm using my hands, it isn't gonna help. <laughs> I was holding my hands up to my computer and realized it's so frustrating. But um, right now the slope is going this way. And I guess what we're talking about is having it you know, shedding more to the left. Um, um, which can someone like show where the, where the wetland area of concern is which side of the driveway over here bottom right bottom right why couldn't you put the the water garden over there right at the edge of that i i think that steve severin uh over at taylor davis certainly could design something very simple that would cost nothing more that would do that exactly y you certainly could do that it just means that you're concentrating all the water that's coming down on the property into the wetland and um and it, it but just if it, but if it comes down into a water um um i'm sorry it's getting beyond my rain ability garden, to like a rain garden a rain garden or a detention basin right there that would capture the rain filter or capture the storm water filter out any silt and the whatever rain was captured would slowly infiltrate into the ground so it wouldn't harm the the wetland if it were there it will would mean them digging out part of the wetland because you know to put in a any a basin or a um a rain garden you, you're going to have to go below grade a little bit so i don't know saying that the wetland the wetland is adjacent to the driveway yeah it is it is, it's like right here. Uh, can you see where my, where it says F19? Yeah. Yeah. It's right here. Actually, it's, it's, uh, it's not right there. It's, okay. um, it's below uh, the end of the driveway. Hmm. And, um, and I, I, if I may uh, reiterate, we, we don't get a horrendous amount of rain coming down. Our main issue with the driveway was leveling it. Um, and if I might point out, it's, to make it more accessible for me because I'm dealing with a, with a disability. Um, and so our main concern is simply making the driveway easier to maintain and level so I can walk on it more easily. It's, sure. not, a, it's not a ton of rain coming down. Well, um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this a little bit and I, um, 
if you if you have a I tried to do some rough calculations just to kind of as a thought experiment. But you know, if you have, if your driveway is a hundred feet long and, and 10 feet wide, and you get um, 1.2 inch storm, which is not that unusual for us to get a rainstorm with 1.2 inches, that's a hundred cubic feet of water. Um, and you know, it goes up from there. So if you have a two inch storm, again, not that unusual, it's, we're talking about hundreds of cubic feet of water. So we got to um, figure out where that water is going to go. Well, I wonder, I, I think a lot of it probably already is flowing off the sides right now because we don't get that much rain coming down toward the end of the driveway. So I think it's probably already flowing off to the well, side somewhat. It, it is. And, and also right now you have a gravel driveway, which means it's pervious. It's absorbing some water. Um, you're converting your driveway from a pervious surface that can absorb water to an impervious service surface. So you're going to have water that currently, you know, does get absorbed that is going to move faster um, because you have a smooth surface and, and because now it's going to be a, an impervious surface, a waterproof surface. So those are the concerns. Although, although, although in a heavy rain, a gravel driveway is... Only pretty pervious. yes yes that's most of the water is is going to in a dry, gravel driveway that's correct um but you know that's some of the thinking about where thinking about where water should go if you're going to pave it on a slope um the other question i have is it just looks like on the plan like they're changing the slope of the driveway um trying to find where did the document go you you guys can still see the site plan yep yes mm -hmm. i don't like screen sharing when i have too many things open okay there we go um it looks like they're changing the pitch um and i thought when um i had spoken with you guys that the pitch was going to be shedding this way to this side of the driveway and now this side this looks a little different than i thought you can condition it so it pitches to the side you prefer. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you can condition it so that a, um, a, a rain garden is installed where you would like it. I mean, I know Willa is interested in trying to get this done this winter. So um, I think it would be helpful to come up with a solution so you can close the meeting tonight. It would be nice to know more about what he meant by a culvert at the bottom of the driveway willa because that isn't like the term that I would have used for what it seems to be I usually think of a culvert as being like a convey like a a pipe basically or a, a tunnel and I don't think that's how he meant it I think he means it as a um I'm not sure how he means it do you well, he did say that it would not have a pipe unless of course you wanted to require one um but he hasn't planned it as a pipe so i'm not sure if culvert is the right word or not um, right we don't really know what he's planning unless you can describe it a little bit more because it doesn't all, all i see is four to six inches of riprap but filling what with like a i don't know pushing the pile back i know there's a pile of gravel there right now yeah, they got so pushed down, but sorry, go ahead. Right, so pushing it back might mean pushing it into the wetland. So that's kind of a concern. Oh, no, we would push it back onto the driveway. Um, oh, okay. That's just gravel that's built up from snow plowing over the years. Okay. And so um, we would just push it back onto the, onto the driveway. Okay. And then um, what is your understanding of what he wants to do down there, what that would look like? Um, it, that he wants the riprap there to basically slow down the water so that it, it doesn't just wash into the yard so quickly, um, but that there isn't so much water coming down that it's necessary to, to do a huge amount there. Um, so is he just talking about like a pile of riprap or he's going to dig it out and line a hole with riprap? I just... I, I think he meant dig down. Um, and then fill, it says four to six inches riprap 
up to a driveway edge. So we so we would dig out a bit and then put in riprap so that that could sort of catch the water coming off the driveway and control the erosion. And and we also would be putting hay bales there to to filter any water coming through. On a temporary basis, right? Not permanently, right? Uh, whichever you would you would require. You could also require that um, uh, a narrow vegetative border be planted there to slow down the water and to um, help absorb it. You could put low shrubs. You could put, I don't know, Don, you're good at this. Do you have any suggestions? I kind of like the idea of the rain garden idea because you know using uh, riprap and gravel at the end of a driveway like that, with even uh, just tall grasses, you know the sinensis, uh, something like that can act as a as a filter strip. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. May I ask a little bit? I'm a little concerned about cost. Um, with a, a, a that, garden. That's what I was suggesting. Um, all these suggestions are the most minimal cost. What they're suggesting <laughs> is that the, the water is going to pick up speed. It's not doing that now. And you're going to end up with a washout at the bottom of the driveway, which is going to create a problem for both you and the commission. So why not head it off now with probably, you know, we're, we're not even talking more than $100 worth of work. Um, sure. If uh, so, I would be planting shrubs at the bottom of the driveway grasses. instead of the riprap. I, I would think grasses. Well, would we want to ask them to do native grasses? Yeah, you don't want it. The sinensis is a, is an Asian yeah, alien right. invasive, basically. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I I prefer to leave it to the homeowner to pick the vegetative matter as long yeah. as you can specify that it's native plant, so that. Right. You know, different people love different plants. You don't want to force that down someone's throat. Right. Yeah. And when would I uh, need to plant them? I mean, because it is winter, would I be planting them in the spring or? In the spring. OK. Right. You could, if you wanted, we could have you uh, present a plan to us, and you could come back, and we could talk with you about it and help you think it through if you wanted, Willa. Um, well, well, I'm concerned about the time frame because we're barely going to be able to get this in for winter. Um, no, I'm saying after, if we were to issue this, oh, okay. one of the conditions would be that you'd come back to us with a planting plan and maybe a more fleshed out layout for this. Okay. Uh, and we could pick when you're going to do that, if, you know, in the next couple months. And then, you know, before spring comes, we could talk to you about it. Okay, as long as I'm not tying myself into something expensive because this project is already really difficult for us. Um, I think this will be a very minor uh, cost compared to the project overall. Well, compared to the project overall, yes, because the project overall is extremely expensive, yes. um, which we can barely afford. So I, I, I mean, are we talking about $100 or $200 or? I'm guessing no more than $100. All right, if it's no more than $100, then I would be totally fine with that. Um, and I can provide you with some rain garden information, which um, we've, we've given to many people who live around the lake. Um, Um, it, can I just clarify, would the rain garden take the place of the riprap? Because we would need some riprap there to, to control the erosion of the edge of the pavement, especially if I'm backing up on it. Um, so are you saying that I should not put riprap, riprap there or, or I should do riprap and plants? No, that, so that is the rain garden, the riprap that they're going to put at the, base of the, at the base of the driveway. You would plant within that. Well, usually, technically, a rain garden is where you you have gravel or riprap, and then you put topsoil on top of it, and you have a, like a berm around it to contain the water. I mean, that's kind of like the way a rain garden is usually constructed. It's not just a pile of riprap. So it would be so we would put in the riprap as planned here, 
And then we would put the garden on top of it? Around the edges of it, yes. Around the edges Around the of edges. it. All right. Um, well, if that, if it's really, you know, $100 and um, we can do it in the spring, I, I'm totally amenable to that. Do we want to think about what the size would need to be? Give it, give, so we could, because, you know, we want to make sure it's sized enough. Um, I think you would make it the width of the driveway and maybe six, it's hard to tell the scale here. There, there are a couple of trees too, right? I mean, there are already some. Um, I'm just saying that if it's the whole width of the driveway, there are trees there, so it might not. That might not. Or trees right here, you mean? Or the trees up here? I don't know where you mean. Um, well, there. You know, it's never mind. It's maybe it's not. Maybe it's not relevant. There are a couple of small birch trees there. That's all. Maybe and that's not relevant. And they're they're good to have there too. Yeah. yeah okay. And also capture the water. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about thirteen. It looks like it's about thirteen feet across right here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I this whole gray area is where they're talking about riprap. Is that right, Willa? Looks that way from the drawing. Yes. Yeah. So that's it's like thirteen, and it's like an L shape. Um, mm -hmm. What you might want to do, though, is to have some of it extending up over here. I think it is. Um, so, yes, I think that, so. There, we're going to have riprap on on uh, the sides of the driveway, in addition to the end, to to control okay. erosion. Right. Well, I know he has. Well, I'm thinking. I'm using my fingers again. This whole area, I think, is in gray. Is supposed to be riprap, is sort of a, a, a like a drainage swale basically an, in, an indentation lined with riprap. Um, I guess what I'm talking about is a more of a planting area here, but oh. I, it's going to be naturally vegetated because it's going to just take over. Natural plant, the native plants will come back. Okay. Um, do we feel, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, commission, do you want to discuss this now and, and figure out whether you feel like you have enough to make a decision? I think we have enough to make a decision. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Scott, Beth, uh, Beth isn't here. Scott and Robin, you feel that way? Yes. Yeah, I said that, but I guess you didn't hear me. I didn't hear. Okay. So um, I will make a motion to close the public meeting for the RDA. Do we have a second? Mary, second. David? Aye. Defont, aye. Harrington? Aye. And Khan? Aye. Okay. Um, Penny, do you have the RDA form pulled up? I do not because I am oh, having right. a problem with the laptop it. and I can't call it up. I'm sorry. Okay. What I'm going to do is I am going to pull up that special conditions template that we were just working on, talking about. And let's go through the conditions that we want and don't want for. Um, a negative determination number three. I'm trying to find the form. Hang on. Really hard to find. I think it's kind of hard to use that form when we really haven't looked at it and agreed to the whole form. Yeah, but I, I mean, I just don't want to have to retype things. So I'd rather cut things. I'd rather err on the side of just cutting out a whole bunch of stuff, Mary, than, um, you know, having to type it all back in. So if you don't mind. Um, we'll try to do it do this quickly as we can. Um, all right. So this would be the conditions for um, 105 West Road and today's date is 11, 11, 21. 
All right, we've decided we don't need to have findings of fact, or do we want to say that we determined that there was a resource area? I think we have been talking about the project's going to impact the area. So we want to say a, um, is it a BVW or is it an isolated wetland? It's I large. Think, I think if you don't know, you need to skip that. Okay. Right. Well, I would have said it was an isolated wetland. I, don't, I didn't know what Don thought. That, um, that's what I would have called it as well. I would have it, and probably- I think it's described as an emergent wetland. An emergent wetland which I don't know if that falls under WPA, would fall under our uh, bylaw. Okay, so number one, general conditions that there's a, could have an enforcement order yet. Yeah. I'm gonna just go through these one by one and then just people pipe, pipe in and say yes or no, keep it or, or no. So do we want this condition number one? No opinion. I don't know. People aren't saying anything. I think it's fine. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, here, the uh, the special conditions don't relieve the applicant of any other requirements. That's kind of boilerplate. May uh, I ask a question about the first point? Yeah. Um, I, it just sounds. It does sound very intimidating. An enforcement order. I. I just. I guess I don't understand what that is. Well. This is really not a condition in the sense that we always have the authority to issue an enforcement order if we felt like somebody wasn't complying with the wetlands law or a, a determination of applicability conditions. We're just making it explicit here for really for your benefit so you know that, that there are there is such a thing as enforcement. It generally does not involve fines, but it does involve you know, an action that might require you to do some repair work if we felt like something was done improperly. And so that is always the case, Willa. If we don't have it as a condition, it's still a condition. We're just making it explicit for you, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, now, this is basically saying, you know, that we can do a site visits. Um, and this is saying with or without probable cause or prior notice, um, which is a standard MACC um, condition. So I'm assuming it's legal to do. But you would, would you notify us first? Um, Just curious. Well, it's, I imagine if there was an emergency situation and we were driving by and went, oh my God, there's something terrible going on, we wouldn't have to, but I generally speaking that it is our policy to notify people. My understanding is you can't enter private property without permission. Even if it's a condition? Yes, you still need to ask permission. Okay, well, we can take it out. Um, Janice, can you confirm that? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, then let's take it out. Because <laughs> I think we don't the only thing that you would need to take out there is without prior notice. Okay, that's the rest of that is applicable. So if you notify them that you're going to do it, that's what you're talking. That sounds. That's right. Hang on a second. Let me. Yeah, take no a With. Um, applicant notice, notification. How's that sound? Okay. Yep. Prior notification. Okay. Um, here is just who the applicant means. I think that's kind of unnecessary. Um, no work will be undertaken until all the appeal periods. I think that's important because you know, maybe in a butter would appeal it. We have had that happen. I think it would be more useful for you to say, state how many days the appeal period is if you're going to do that. Okay. 
Um, I'm having trouble changing that. Okay, um, is it 10 days, I believe? I believe it's 10 days. Until the 10 day period. Um, Does that mean that we wouldn't be able to proceed for 10 days from now? Yeah. You can proceed um, at your own risk. I'm not sure what. Uh, and a butter, if an abutter wanted, they could appeal this um, determination, Willa, and they have 10 days to file an appeal. Okay, I, I just didn't understand. Okay, so we could proceed as, and, and if, but if the an abutter- that if, that if you started the work, you might be in trouble if, if someone did appeal it. But I, you know, can't, we can't really advise you about that. That's really, that's, um, Again, this is putting, we're putting this in as a condition, but it's actually the reality anyway. We're just making you aware of it by putting it in as a condition because people always, abutters would have the right to appeal. And if they won the appeal, it's possible that the determination would not be upheld. And so that's always a risk. And so we're just letting you know that really. Um, so the applicant should provide a copy of these conditions to whoever's doing the work. I think that's important. So we don't have a situation where someone says, well, I didn't know the app, you know, land order didn't tell me. We know if we, we've had concerns about contractors sometimes making mistakes, we wanna make sure that the contractors are informed. Commission, you commissioners agree? I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So please speak up if you're not because um, I don't, can't know otherwise. Um, number six, anyone doing this work is subject to the same regulations. So um, that's again, just making it clear to everybody that the Wetlands Protection Act and the town wetlands bylaw applies to everybody. Okay. Um, if there are any changes made, which could alter the subject area, um, the applicant, is required to inform us. And if it's a minor change, we may say that's not a big deal, but we do want to know if you're doing something substantially different. Is that okay? Okay. No. Um, it's your responsibility to complete any review required by other agencies. I don't think that's relevant here. That might be relevant if you were putting in a septic system and Board of Health had to approve it. So I'm gonna take that out. Um, number eight, all construction materials may only be stockpiled or collected in areas as shown labeled, but it's not shown or labeled. Or if no such areas are shown, must be placed outside the resource area. I don't think it's possible to be outside the buffer zones because the whole property is buffer zone. Um, so I would take that out and say under a waterproof tarp. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, the idea here is that if a bunch of material gets dropped off at your house, Willa, um, and it takes a few days for the work to happen and it rains, we don't want all this stuff washing all over the place. So we're asking people to put waterproof tarps over them. Okay. Okay. Um, no material can be buried or dispersed. Is that? Yes or no? They are going to put in riprap. It's not being, they're not excavating out a hole like they would for a detention basin. They're just laying riprap at the base of the driveway. Right. But that's, but that's described in the plan. Right. right. So yeah, we can, which is what that says. Not, but this is basically saying no any other, no ex, no other work, no other digging, okay. burying. Okay. No pumping of water. That's not irrelevant. For Lake Wyola, we don't have to worry about that. Waste products, grub stumps. Um, is this irrelevant here? Take it out. Yes. Um, no fuel, I guess we can take that out. 
Um, any material placed in the ret when the race by the, without. Okay, I think we can take that out. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, no underground storage. We don't have to worry about that. Removal of hazardous waste. I don't think we need this whole section. Um, so we are making it simpler. Okay. Trash dumpsters, not relevant for this one, I think, right? Mm -hmm. These uh, conditions only authorize activity described on the plan and approved documents, uh, other additional. So do we wanna add the additional details? Um, the applicant shall uh, design a rain garden at the location um, described on the site plan as a potential culvert site. The rain garden, can we give us dimensions? I don't think you know the dimensions yet. I think the plan should provide the dimensions. Um, should we, the rain garden I would say it's the, uh, the approximate width of the driveway and some feet wide. Don, do you have a suggestion on how wide it should be? The driveway at the base there is 13 feet wide. So 13 feet wide by uh, six feet in depth. Okay, approximately. Approximately. Yes. That, that seems quite large for the $100. Well, all right, never mind. So no, that's, I, that's, I, that's all the riprap that you're already planning on doing. That's right. It's just it's, it's just the spread of the riprap is all it is. And the plant and the planting doesn't cover the entire area typically. It's around okay. the Okay. Okay. Um before um construction. Construct well before construction or before the uh, planting occurs. Before the planting, to, or do we just want to give them a date saying by February 15th or something or March 1st? Yeah, put a date. I think a date's better. Okay, because that gives you some time to do some research. Um, all right, 2022. 2022. Okay. <laughs> Any other pieces that we wanted that we discussed? Oh, we were talking about um, the applicant shall revise the site plan to um, slope, to change the slope, slope of the driveway such that water will shed to the what direction are we talking about please because i'm not looking at the map away from the wetland well so the, uh to the north so it would be shedding to the north right would it be shedding to both sides or or uh, mm -hmm. maybe to both sides well because if it was going only toward the north i think that would head it too much toward our house mm -hmm. Again, that that's I I feel like pitch on a driveway like that. It, they've already made their plan. They've already decided how they're going to do this. Um, it would have been helpful to have the contractor here to answer that question. But I would just say, say the pitch should be to the right of the driveway. Well, I I want to have a, a ordinal direction. The pitch of the driveway. Should be to the. Are you talking to the south, then, Don? If you're saying I, right, I'm trying to imagine what that. It it's it's got to be west, I think. Southwest, I think. So, in yeah. other words, the way we have it on the plan the now. Run, the road yeah. runs north. The road runs north south. So the driveway is perpendicular to West Pelham Road. So right now they have it all pitching to the south, which is where that wetland is, where we want the rain garden. Do we want any of it directed to the north? 
I don't I don't think you can change that now at this point. Okay. Um, you're you're too right. far along in the project planning. It would have had to been something they would have had to stipulate that when they asked for the design. How about um, the riprap channel on the side of the driveway? Do we want to specify that since it's not clear? The um, rip wrapped um, swales to the sides of the driveway will be at least 12 inches wide at the top? Uh, yes. Um, well, uh, th there is a large tree there so that in the drawing. Yes. Excepting where Exists. So I, I think it's that part is a little unclear to me. I'm not sure that I can um, uh, I just I'm not I'm not sure we can actually do that or not. Um okay. Um Mir Miriam, add the phrase to the extent practicable there. Thank you. We're really wanting I think the the issue with this condition really Willa is um, the width of the nominal width of the swales. But um, I'm also concerned about cost if it's 12 inches wide through the whole thing or um... You know, we've already closed the public meeting, so we really shouldn't be having this discussion um, beyond, I mean, really, this should be just between the commission at this point. I feel like it's, we're, we're trying to make this as um, user-friendly for you, and, and we are trying to accommodate you, but I think we, um, we need to kind of lay out what we, what we wanted first. Okay, okay. Um, anything else that we've discussed, guys, that we want on this? in terms of the general design features. I don't see any. Okay. So pre-construction prior to the beginning, you'll have stake out erosion controls and we'll do a site visit. Yep. Um, and we'd like to have you or the person who's doing the work present to confirm that the erosion controls are in the proper place. And um, we don't see site erosion controls on this, do we? For the work, I don't see anything. I think it's really gonna be hard to put in erosion control if the driveway truly abuts the, um, the wetland. How would you do that? Well, you could still put, you can put an erosion sock along that, that perimeter um, to keep it all from, in case, you know, prevent erosion, further erosion. I mean, I think there has to be some erosion controls, right? I mean, isn't that a pretty standard thing we require? I would think there'd have to be some erosion control with all the work that's being done. Um, we'll be I, don't, I don't recall on the map though, if that was already depicted. It's not along the um, edge of the um, area to be paved. And I think you want to specify a silt sock here rather than um, something that's more harmful to the wetland. Yeah, I think we have that down below. Um, the approved erosion control will serve as a limit of work. Um, erosion controls will be inspected by the applicant or in place. This is important. Um, workers will be informed that no machinery, storage of machinery materials can go beyond that line at any time. Um, and then purple place um, um, damaged. Um, 
a, an erosion sock with straw will be used for the erosion. Those additional straw bales may be added as is appropriate. How's that sound? Do you need that all the way up and down the driveway or just down at the bottom where the wetland is? I'm assuming it's just at the bottom. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking along the bottom right. Yeah. And, and at the bottom itself. Yeah, I was thinking at the bottom. Um, along the uh, bottom of the driveway and the um, southern uh, 20 feet of the side of the driveway near the between the wetlands. Between. Can you just draw it on the plan and submit that plan as part of your determination? It's often helpful to look at a picture. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. And I would do that for the where you want the rain garden as well, just so mm -hmm. there's no confusion. Does that seem right? About 20 feet? Sounds right. Okay. All right, um, no clearing of vegetation or soil disturbance before the preliminary site visit. Yes. Um, minimal disturbance may be allowed if it happens. This is not necessary. Okay. Um, I already said that the, it's going to be the limit of the work. No. Nope. Um, erosion controls will be inspected, stockpile. Erosion sock with straw, um, no construction during when it's raining. Um, I would say probably this is not something that we're gonna do, imposing additional conditions, right? Right. And I don't think we need this piece unless we wanna specify no hay, no hay is to be used. Um, so take that out. At any point and before, during and after, All right, are we back again? I think so. It was telling me that I was now the host. I hope that's some kind of just some little weird thing. So Miriam, I can't hear you. Can other people hear Miriam? No, I can hear her now. Okay. I can't. Can you talk, Miriam? You're, You're muted, muted, Miriam. Unmute yourself. Yes, now I can. That ah, was great. Okay. What just happened? I were you know. guys kicked out? Were you guys kicked out? Yep. Yes. It totally restarted me back in. So. It's just weird that it restarted without I don't even know what that was about. Okay. 
I'm sorry, guys. I was asking a question and nobody was answering. It. I was like, Why aren't they talking to me? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm, I'm losing my mind here. At any time we would ask for control, ocean controls. That's so a your screen point. share is gone too. Oh, okay. Let me get back to the screen share. I am no longer the host. I can't screen share. I, I don't know why, but I had a little thing on the top where it went through saying each of the people listed was the host and I was the last one. And it says you are now the host. So I let Grace back in and asked me and I said yes. And How did you end up being the I don't know. <laughs> You're not even on the commission. That's no. the you should, Janice, you should be able to make Miriam the host. How? Okay. So are you on a phone or a computer? Computer. All right. Let me see if I remember this. Thank you. I think. Thank you. Uh, if you go click the participants button. Oh, okay. All right. And then next to Miriam's name, there should be a video icon. Oh, let's see. And you okay. click that, and that might do it. Um, yeah, usually it'll give you a chance to make them co-host. It also says land use clerk as co-host. Who's that? That's Penny. That's Penny. Penny, you're a co-host. Can you make uh, me a host? Uh, let me try. Okay, I just did it to, do you want to change Miriam to host? And I said, yes. And it okay, says Miriam should, is now the host. That Great. should do it. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. <laughs> That was very fun times we're having here. Okay, can you guys see the document again? Yes. Yep. All right. I'm sorry, this is taking a while, but at any time, construction phase, um, applicant, um, and any involved in the activity of subject to this condition shall notify us if there is a problem. Do you want that or no? No, I don't. I don't know if we need it. Well, it just means that then it's on them to inform us if there's a problem. Okay. Can we leave it in? Okay. All right. Um, at least once a week until the ground is stabilized would we'll determine what is this? Um, from a, inspect the site. Um, I don't think that's necessary at this one with some of them where the people are not living there. I would say that might be more of an issue. I don't think it is. Um, equipment parked and outside of the wetlands. It's kind of already said that we've said they can't go outside the wet, in, outside the, the limit of work. So I'm gonna take that out. Is that okay? Okay. Um, storm water shall be constructed. That's not necessary. Fuel storage, not necessary. Um, tree removal will not include removal of stumps. Do we want to say that? He might, have to, he might have to remove some. Even the stumps? He might. OK. Just uh, brush and refuse not in the buffer zone. Everything's buffer zone. I don't think the project includes, um, well, maybe. I would just like leave that. that. Leave it? I would just. Yeah, we don't need septic. Um, are you going to be doing any grass seeding? Because um, I don't think I know this from the plan, Willa. Not planning to. OK. Um, so we have her coming back with a site a plant a planting plan with native plants right did we say native plants i'm just looking rain garden um by march did, we didn't say native plants we want to specify native plants yes, yes. yeah The good part about native plants is that they grow well because <laughs> they want to be here. <laughs> um, all right. Post construction erosion control remain until vegetation is established and the site is stable 
and contact us for a post-construction site visit. I would also include that once the site is stable that the erosion control must be removed. Okay, we did it. All right, that was a long one. Um, so um, have we approved this? Have we done the vote to approve this? No. Okay. So somebody want to make a motion? You need to make a motion to, yeah, to approve it as a negative three and with the conditions that you specified. Yes. Okay, I move that we um, reach a determination of applicability negative number three with conditions, um, with special conditions as um, approved by the commission. And Willa, just so you know, a negative three means the project is being approved. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Good point. I'll second that, Mary. All right, David. Aye. Defont, I. Harrington. Harrington, we still have Robin or? You're muted, Robin. You can just- Three, I. Con. I. Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop the share. All right, Willa, um, we will get this back to you. And um, um, we'll, we'll probably send you, we'll, you'll get this by certified mail and we'll send you a digital copy as well by email. Okay, so I will, so I'll get it in a few days, basically? Uh, hopefully tomorrow, I don't know. Oh, tomorrow. I, well, no, it will be mailed tomorrow. It'll be, It'll mailed, be mailed tomorrow, tomorrow but, um, you know, the digital copy could be emailed to you tomorrow. Okay, so, and then I'm free to proceed and I'll give a copy of this to the contractor and then we can proceed? Yep. Okay, thank and, you. Um, I don't know that I asked the commissioners this, but I have everybody's permission to sign digitally for you. Yes. I'll agree to that. Yes. Okay, thank you, Willa. I'm glad, I'm happy for your patience and I'm sorry this has been such a complicated process for you, but thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think a rain garden will look beautiful. So something you can hopefully enjoy as well as- I can afford it. <laughs> I, I, think you, I think it'll be affordable. Okay. So um, the next okay. thing- we, So are you gonna do this, go through the same process for Mr. Whitney as well? Well, I'm hoping that we will, it'll be much shorter <laughs> um, because it's a much simpler situation. That is my- um, so, um, so, do you need me anymore? I think I'm going to exit the meeting. I don't think we do you have anything. Um, we're going to talk at some point before we end, we have to talk about the upcoming meeting with the select board. I don't know if you want to be there for that or not. I've already talked with you. So you kind of, no, I mean, I, I think, I think much of it is better to happen during the meeting rather than ahead of time. So yeah, I think you can just give people a heads up. Okay. Um, yep. And if you, Miriam, if you email me all this information, I'll go in and send out the DOAs tomorrow. That'd be great. Thank okay. you, Penny. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, Penny. Good night, Penny. So, um, Somebody has a question there, Miriam. Yes. Who has a question? Hi, it's Kate Wilkins. I was wondering if you've already issued the positive or negative determination for the uh, Wendell Road pole installation project, or if that's um, last on the list. Did we vote on it? You voted yeah. to close the hearing. We haven't done that yet. Yeah, okay. you should do that for both the Whitney one and, and the... Um, we, have, we have to get through these two more. Yeah. So we have not. Okay, I'm going to exit. Good night. Good night. But we have closed the public meeting, so we can't have public di discussion about it. Correct. Yes. Okay, so for Lake Drive, um, 
what do we want for conditions? Erosion controls. The limit of work, erosion socks, right? Yeah. Uh, do we want to have, I mean, basically, you know. No berm. No berm near the road. No berm. Okay. Um, I mean, essentially, we could use the same template that we just went through and just add those details. Is that okay with people? Whatever you think is fastest. <laughs> I think that's fastest. <laughs> <laughs> what do other people think? Sure. I think that's fine as long as you take out things that aren't relevant. Right. Because I think that, you know, we don't want to, you know, I would not want to, you know, have some DOAs where we have two things and some where we have 30 things, I think we have to have some consistency um, in our approach to it. But um, I, I'm hoping that this will be a good, you know, that this won't freak people out and that maybe we can just explain to people and that that will be more actually being more transparent. Um, okay, so if those are the conditions, then um, somebody want to make a motion. So I have the right, the standard conditions and then the erosion sock, limit of work, we already talked about, and no berm. Um, was there anything else that was critical on that site? I didn't I hear know. any. I don't believe, oh, and no change in the footprint. Right. Um, of the of the existing yeah. driveway. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I don't think so. So I make a motion that we issue a uh, negative three determination, a negative determination number three with the conditions as approved by the commission. Mariel second. Okay. David? Aye. The font. Aye. <laughs> Her um, Harrington. Aye. And Khan. Aye. Okay. Now we have the utility poll. And. Excuse me. Can I ask a question? Yes. This is Joe Sauber. I was on the, you had me on as something for tonight. And I don't know if I was supposed to, what it was. That's why I've been waiting. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I think it was probably just follow up from the site visit. Um, uh, the last one we got approved, but the guy who's doing all of my paperwork for the RDA will have it for your next meeting. So okay. I wanted to let you know that. So if that's what you're waiting for, he's doing all the drawings and everything and submit it. He'll be submitting it to you. And I guess there's a couple other groups he's got to submit it to. From I talked to him yesterday. Okay. So I don't know if you if there was something you needed to talk to me about, or is this something I don't I think, to I don't think we do, Joe. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't gonna miss something I was supposed to be on. <laughs> That's all. Okay. So um, thank you though. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm, I'm glad you spoke up. Um, I'm sorry to stop in the middle of your meeting, but if you don't need no, me and no, why the, should you be here? Um, <laughs> so for the utility poll. Um, the issue was no, um, no, no work within 10 feet of the um, BVW or bank. Was that it? Yes. Okay. Were there, are there anything else we wanted? So I'm not remembering without going through my notes. I think that was the only thing. I think the rest of the plan had looked good. Right. Let me just take a quick. That's all I had in my notes. Okay, good. That's about what I think. Minor erosion controls, what kind of equipment you're running. Okay. That's all we got, right? So it's one. So then it would be a negative number three. Hmm. Yep. Under the town wet law, not uh, the, the wet law, <laughs> under the town bylaw, wetlands bylaw not the uh, Wetlands Protection Act. So somebody wanna make a motion? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. Uh, see if they can remember I'll see. I'll make a motion that for a um, a negative number three with the town bylaws with the identified conditions be approved. Okay, I'll second that. David. Aye. Stefan, aye. Harrington. Aye. Khan. Aye. Okay. All right, we're not done yet. It's a long meeting. Um, so we have another, don't please save some brain cells because we have another kind of <laughs> thing, another tricky thing we have to talk about, which is the certificate of compliance request for January Hills Road. Um, I got a phone call right before this meeting from the landowner um, Ellen Waldinger, and I sent you guys the draft enforcement order. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at it. No. Did you just send that today? Sent it today. So yeah, I didn't see that. When I, I didn't, talk see, I didn't with, see that either. Okay, I will send it. I'll you, I'll, yeah. I'll screen share it. But okay. uh, when I had talked with Mark Stinson, he said the simplest way, because he's hard hearted and doesn't care <laughs> he doesn't have to talk to people <laughs> who are upset um he said the easiest thing to do is an enforcement order under the original order of conditions because you have jurisdiction under that order of conditions and you can require the applicant to bring the site under compliance with those original site plans and conditions because last time we met we had talked about this idea of decoupling the certificate of compliance from an enforcement order. Remember, we had that discussion that we wanted to kind of separate them. Mark Stinson kind of made it sound like um, if there was an appeal or a challenge, EPA, uh, a DP would not be very eager to defend that kind of decoupled enforcement order. Though I think theoretically, we could do an enforcement order just based on the idea that we think there are um, conditions that could lead to a release into the wetlands or, or have caused a release into the wetlands. Um, but he made it sound like if you were just going to go and develop, uh, uh, execute an enforcement order based on something happening in the buffer zone, um, where it's not tied to any order of conditions or a determination of applicability, that that was not their preference. Okay. So that kind of led me down that pathway of drafting that enforcement order, which I've sent to you guys, and I will share it in a minute. Ellen Waldinger called me and said, I'm, you know, she was upset that she really wants to refinance, that she wants this to happen quickly, um, that she feels like this, pro this site was in compliance, but 30 years have gone by and now it's impossible to really prove that. And now there's new problems, which she was acknowledging. She wasn't denying that there are new problems on the driveway, but she wanted to find a solution that would allow her to refinance because she feels it's gonna save her money to refinance quickly, which again, is not our problem. However, you know, we also don't want to go out of our way to make it more difficult than we have to. We want to find the best solution. Um, I said to her, you know, frankly, that the concern might be that if we do not do this order, this enforcement order under the order of conditions, we've kind of lost our leverage to really require work to bring the project or the site back to the condition we want it to be in. Um, it's neater and cleaner to do it now while there's still the order of conditions in place. Um, but I thought the commission might be open to suggestions if there was some other avenue. One of my thoughts had been and I, I threw this out to her to consider is that if she would agree to file an RDA for the driveway repairs, then we would know that we were gonna have an opportunity 
to condition those driveway repairs and discuss them. And then perhaps we could come to the conclusion that the a certificate of compliance could be issued. You guys, are you guys following me? Is that making mm -hmm. sense? It's faster yeah. to do an enforcement order though. What? It's faster and simpler to do an enforcement order because we already have the jurisdiction. And the only problem is that the work that she needs to have done is going to require an engineering plan and it's not going to get done by the end of this year that it's probably oh. going to take several months and uh, because you know there's that crushed culvert that has to be dealt with and i don't see how you can give her a complete certification you can give her a certificate of compliance with a partial completion and then you can put in there that the driveway culvert has to be fixed replaced or whatever i don't know if that'll be enough for the bank or not no, it won't be. Uh, it sounds like it won't be enough for the bank. And I mean, I I thought the idea here was to do the, get the compliance issued and then treat the driveway problems as a, a new problem, a new, your RDA suggestion sounds a lot more appropriate, but I, I'm not voting on this. You guys are. So. Well, I, I, we need to, you know, your input. Scott has a question. Yes, yeah, Scott, go ahead. Scott, you could just shout. You don't have to raise your hand, be polite. <laughs> well, I, uh, I think I'm picking up on the thread that Don threw out there in, in that. I, I'm still thinking that, you know, the decoupling both, I, I understand what, um, what the state was saying, but I also think that decoupling makes the most sense to me. I think that the original violation was one for, you know, that took place during construction and this was several decades ago. I think there are new, you know, uh, questions that have come into play with uh, recent work, but, but it doesn't make sense to me that we would be going back to the original enforcement order, I, I wouldn't think that their attorneys would want to enforce the original uh, enforcement orders that you know are, are several decades old right now anyway. So I, that argument doesn't really resonate with me. I, I still- am I'm not sure much... I understand what you mean by enforcement order. It's the order of conditions you mean, or do you mean the enforcement issue that came up? The enforcement issue, I think where I think what you were saying is that state they're saying that they wouldn't want to decouple them, but I, I, I'm not sure, given how much time has gone by, that either one of them are anything that an attorney would want to take up right now anyway. So I'm, I'm more interested in the path forward, and we have a landowner here who is interested in, you know, doing what's needed moving forward is my understanding, so I, I would rather move towards that and let them refinance and then work towards so, the future. So um, I believe that the the enforcement order got resolved. So I'm not, I, I, I wasn't talking about anything re related to that past enforcement order. As we don't have any good records about it. We know that it was issued, but presumably it was resolved because um, a certificate of occupancy. Okay. Well, maybe I'm this. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. What I think we, I thought where we were last was we were decoupling that past order from where we were with the present issues for the driveway. And what I was hearing you say, Miriam, is that the state had concerns about decoupling that. But maybe I'm not tracking with you. So, so we know that there were um, the original order of conditions and the original site plan. We know that the uh, applicant came back to the Conservation Commission with a revised septic system, but they didn't do any updates to the driveway design. So there are two site plans. One is for the septic design and one is for the original driveway construction. And um, there was an enforcement order in t during the construction period because they were not stabilizing things. They had improper erosion controls. And it looked, there were some photographs in the file that make it look like they weren't, the driveway 
uh, swales weren't constructed properly. There are photographs of them that show them dug out, but with no rip wrap. So I'm assuming that they were photographed to show that they should have been rip wrapped. Um, and they probably required them to be rip wrapped. Um, Ellen tells me they were rip wrapped at one time, but they don't exist anymore. They've filled in with dirt. So you can't even see where those swales were. Um, so we could take the position that we are confident that the original design was built as plan as approved, um, but that subsequent maintenance problems have emerged. Um, so I mean, I think I'm hearing that that's what everybody's saying. It's, yeah, you know, there's enough to say they did what they did and the other problems are now new. And right. so I, I would be in favor of just going giving them a certificate of compliance. And if she's willing to submit an RDA for the work that still needs to be done, then okay. we can address it that way. So um, what happened was we had to deny the certificate of compliance request because the original one that came in was filled out improperly. It had the wrong DP number. It didn't have any site plans referenced and there was no as built engineer certification, which is required. So um, Scott, do you have another question? You still have your hand up. So we had to deny it and I, we sent, I drafted a letter. I think I, I forwarded it to you guys, um, basically explaining to them what they need to do to resubmit the request for a certificate of, of compliance. They have to resubmit it. She hasn't done it yet because she needs to get an engineer to certify it. And she's, had, she's finally found an engineer who's willing to do that. So he needs the uh, original site plans because she doesn't even have them. So we have to coordinate with him to get him copies of the site plans that are in our files. And then he can certify it and then she'll submit a new certificate of compliance request. So we don't have a certificate of compliance request before us right now. Um, I, what I'm hearing people say is they would like to approve it once it gets submitted. Do we want to say to her, that we would like to see the RDA at the same time. So that, we, I mean, there is a possibility that she will go and sell this house as soon as the certificate of compliance is lifted, is lifted off the deed. And then we would have no input in this. That could happen. I, she says it isn't gonna happen, but again, this is where, you know, we're giving up some jurisdiction here. So I'm wanting to kind of figure out what the best for path forward is. We could also just issue an enforcement order right now separately for the problems with the driveway and try to get her to do the repairs under an enforcement order. I could, I could revise the, the enforcement order and decouple it from the order of conditions. You want to do that? I like decoupling, <laughs> whatever. I know, I know. So um, this is what I want to suggest. We're going to meet on the 9th. And in the next couple of weeks, fi I'll find out from Ellen whether she wants to submit an RDA. Um, if she says not, then I'll draft an enforcement order for us to approve. If she says yes to an RDA, then that, that'll be our, our instrument. Is that clear? And we'll have an answer by our next meeting. Hopefully we'll have an answer by our next I'm, I'm sure she wants to get this resolved. So I'm sure okay. she, will, she will want to. I think she would appreciate our being flexible and trying to think creatively about this. And the bottom line is we just want to get the driveway repaired. You know, I don't care really how it happens under just want to get repaired. So, um, and I think she, see, you know, she seems a little confused about what's needed. So I think that actually having some oversight is a good idea for us. But um, anyway, um, let's, we have no decision to make right now then uh, because we don't have, she has to resubmit right. the certificate of request. Okay, okay. So that makes it easy for us. Um, you Did you guys get to look at the documents I sent about the Southbrook Conservation Area? I skimmed them. I, I it, There was a lot there, uh, so I didn't have as much time to dig into it. Yeah, I, I skimmed them too. All right. I, I, I had a general there. idea of what they say. So the, so the takeaway is that I had a conversation 
with the grant officer at, in the state in this at the state that it was responsible for the land grants that were used to purchase these two parcels. And the terms of those land grants was that the properties have to be under the supervision and management of the Conservation Commission. That was a term of the grant. And if the Conservation Commission was no longer managing those properties, then the town would be out of compliance with the terms of the grant and it might jeopardize their future eligibility for grants of this type. So essentially not a path that I think the town would wanna to go down. Um, I think that's the key point, Mary, was what you're making is that we, there's an approved plan that, says, that states that, you know, driving on these units is not permissible and that the responsibility for management of these properties is to the Conservation Commission. So I, to be able to implement our own management plan, if that's not within the jurisdiction of the commission, I'm confused as to- What, what management means. What correct. Is that? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I think that's- He that's also a, said that it is a condition of these grants that motor vehicle use is not allowed. The terms of the grants are that these properties can only be used for passive recreation and that motor vehicle use does not, unless it's for like emergency services or fire and safety kinds of things, um, other kinds of motor vehicle use, unauthorized motor vehicle use is not allowed. And in fact, she said these properties have to be posted for that because it's a condition of the grant. The grant requires appropriate signage and that that's also a condition of the grant. So she was um, confused about why this would be a problem. Um, one of the concerns that came up for me, and I guess we'll learn more in just talking about with town council is, if in fact this is true that a bylaw is needed to enact any regulations on these properties, um, what I'm confused about is that that's really asking town meeting to set policy. And town meeting already voted to uh, appoint the Conservation Commission to be in charge of managing policy for these properties. That was a condition of the grant was that town meeting voted to approve the use of these grant funds with the understanding that the property would be managed by the Conservation Commission. It says that in the original town meeting warrant, even going back to 1965. So, you know, what, ha what does it make sense to require future town meeting votes when there's already been a town meeting vote? I think that's something we need to find out from our attorney, our town council. Yeah, Later I think all the documentation was pretty clear that the responsibility lies with the conservation committee and that was voted on already to give right. us that authority, you know? I mean, the problem, like I'm, I don't play devil's advocate here, but let's say, for example, you went before town meeting to get some bylaws passed and town meeting said, oh boy, we really don't like having the conservation commission in charge of conservation land. Let's change it and take the conservation commission off of any oversight. Now the town is not in compliance with the terms of the self-help grant. Um, you know, these things, I mean, I, that's like an extreme um example, but it's the question of like, once authority has been granted by town meeting, does it make sense to go back and ask for more, ask again? Didn't, uh, didn't Scott already bring up the point that you guys want to have some sort of coherent policy for all of your conservation areas? You know, there's, there's more than one area we're talking about, especially there's one on Leverett Road that's uh, that big culvert that's there, that property that's uh, adjacent to that, roads and cars and access there, no signs. They're not all um, under conservation management. I, 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 was, I would have not found, and maybe there is such a thing, and Penny's not here, if there's an inventory of all the conservation properties in town. I did some digging in the deeds, the Franklin County um, deeds. And I found some properties I wasn't aware of that are under the supervision of the CONCOM, but um, there's a lot of properties owned by the town. Not all of them are conservation land. So I think that's, I don't know which are and which are not. They're in, they're listed in the open space plan. And then the, 
Yes, yes, that's it's an important part of the open space plan that you have to list the protected and unprotected land and who manages the protected land. And it's, they're on a map as well, I believe, if I remember well, that's correctly. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I, that makes so much sense. <laughs> Thank you. And, so these things exist. And, and I, I, I just want to say, I think it's total hogwash that it require a bylaw to post your conservation land um, for no motor unauthorized motor vehicles. That's nonsense, especially because, as you said, the grant itself requires that there's no motorized vehicles except for like emergencies or something like that. That's when I that. asked when I asked um, Melissa Cryan, who is this land grant program uh, program manager, she said that it was very typical for conservation land to have uh, trails blocked with barriers, physical barriers of one kind or another, either a cable or chains or boulders. Um, to prevent um, illegal or unpermitted motor vehicle access. That that's, that's like a low bar because it's, you know, and, and, you know, you might want to not have boulders because if you needed emergency equipment to get in there, maybe you'd want to have a chain or something. I don't know. I mean, that's a question to ask. It's a debate, but um, okay. So this will get discussed more, but I, I just wanted to kind of give you guys the update of where I, where that document came from to, you know, I'm going to send it to um, the I would, I would just like to say something real quick. Sure. Uh, thank you. I just want to clarify that um, Conservation Commission does not need to go to town meeting to get a bylaw passed to post land that is Conservation Commission land. And to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't been seriously proposed. And I think that a lot of this conversation should happen at the select board meeting. All right, that's all I wanted to say, thanks. Okay, thanks for that information, Grace. It has been proposed to us um, by email. We were told that we needed a bylaw. So that's what we're responding to. Um, but we'll learn more when we have that meeting. Um, Okay, is there anything else that we, we have a couple of site visits that we need to schedule. Um, I'm thinking we'll do them next week. Um, I know 585. Um, we need to do 585 West Pelham Road for a building permit. This is the same site where we just approved the uh, um, the, the uh, poles. Um, I also see that we need to do a site visit for the cell tower project. I'm not really sure why that is. I, I haven't asked Penny what that pro, what that's about, but perhaps they're about to be doing construction and they want us to do um, erosion control checks and 586 Wendell Road, uh, which is Wim Levine, a deck project. So, um, it's really getting dark now by 530. It really doesn't make sense doing late afternoon site visits. So I just want to find out when, if I try to coordinate these, uh, when would the commissioner like to do them? I mean, I think that's really a question for the people that have time constraints. You know, I'm a little more flexible with my time. But, you know, I know Beth can do it at 3.30 usually. Um, and I think it's probably still light enough at 3.30, but I don't, I don't know, is four o'clock too late? I think you could do 3.30 to 4.00, four, four. you know, pushing it to 4.30, you're, depending on what you're looking at, you're going to start to get dark. Yeah, I don't, I'm, yeah, 430, it's, you know, if you're going to have to go bushwhacking, I don't think that makes any sense. Um, do you want to consider starting to go to a weekend time for the winter months? And just like do it on a Sunday. I mean, I, I defer to all of you. I, I have constraints during the week, um, but I also have complete confidence in the rest of the commission to, to, you know, if you have time to get out there and take a look at it, that's great. So um, 
happy to look on the weekends or I'm happy to defer to all of you during the week. So if I were to set any up for a Sunday, like one o'clock noon, I just want to figure out mornings on Sundays aren't usually really good for me before like 11, but I could do after 11. As long as there's not a big football game, you know. I was going to say, if you're avoiding all the Patriots games, I'm okay. Yeah, it's good. If you're a big football fan, you're getting into my football time here now, you know. Mac Jones, he's lighting it up. <laughs> Okay, well, I will email you guys once I can set those yeah, up. Give us some options. And I feel um, like before we head out, there was one thing. I just, let me check my notes to see. I feel like there was something in here that I had to mention. Um, oh, this is so important. Like the most important thing of the whole night. <laughs> We've, we're offering a position to a new land use clerk. Ah, oh, okay. Um, I believe her name is Adrian. I hope that's right. I might have it wrong. And she's a really interesting person. I hope she accepts it. Um, she has a, she's a recent graduate of, of, of loss of a law school. She has a law degree. Wow. And she is moving to Shootsbury and, um, is really interested in land use and regulate learning about land use regulations and she's super bright that's fantastic she seems like a very cool person and i think uh she will be very motivated so um and she will take great minutes i think <laughs> awesome so that's awesome great. so awesome so um again you know, she hasn't accepted yet. I think that they're going to, they're, well, I'm, maybe I'm speaking too soon. I guess they're checking references, but I, I imagine her reference will be stellar. So I think that the idea is to offer her a position. So hopefully that will all happen. If not, we're back to whatever we're uh, back to. Resuming right. the page. So. Well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I hope that works. Okay. All right, so we are on um, our next meeting is December 2nd, where we were going to talk more about notice of intent policies. Um, I've been taking some notes from attending the public hearings for the Amherst ConCom. So hopefully we can go over some of that stuff and um, hopefully have shorter meetings in the future. So you need to listen to the you left the meeting a little early the other day. There was a lot of interesting talk after you left. Oh, was there? Wait, I left what meeting? The, the meeting about the, the, with the Lake Wyola, you know, height restrictions. And oh, there was the, let's say the planning board and the zoning board were meeting. Oh, the height restrictions. Yes. Okay. But, but the height restriction is that afterwards they got into talking a lot about solar projects and you know, a lot of the lawsuits that have gone on in between, and there, there was oh, a lot of interesting about the Waltham, the Waltham project. Yes. I think there was a question about whether the planning board would uh, write an amicus brief. Are they going to do that? Well, they went round and round about lots of things and who wrote what and predictions for where lawsuits were going to go and, yeah. you know, what things were going to happen. It, it just was very interesting to, to yeah. listen to some of the so the, the, rest of the, yes, discussion. the issue is that the um, the Supreme Judicial Court is reviewing a whole bunch of lawsuits related to regulation, towns regulating solar projects. And so um, the issue is around, you know, towns, whether their solar bylaws are enforceable or not. Mm. And they went into some of the projects that people had about, you know, I, defending it in East Long Meadow and other places and how it went and you know mm -hmm. where they where they thought judicial things were leading this was an interesting know. interesting it's conversation it's hard, it's, hard it's hard to know something has to probably change but anyway it's hard to know okay all right thank you everybody motion to adjourn motion well <laughs> happy thanksgiving everyone and happy veterans day thanksgiving. happy veterans happy veterans day all happy, that. Veterans happy veterans day, day. We're all Thank seconding. You. Happy emotions. snow next week. Okay. Good night. Oh. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Grace.